Hi, TDF. I am Ryan J. Haddad. I am a Lebanese American man with short black hair that has some patches of gray in it. I'm wearing round tortoiseshell glasses and a button down shirt with blue and maroon squares. And I'm coming at you from my desk chair in my apartment. And I'm joined by Oh, me. Hi, TDF. My name is Alejandra Ospina. I am a light-skinned Latina. I am also sitting in the living room of my apartment in Lower Manhattan. I am sitting in my wheelchair, although you can't see it. I'm wearing a black shirt and slightly cat-eye glasses and a pink headband. And I am joined by... Hello, TDF. Hi, everyone. My name is Dicky Hartz. This is my name sign for those on the call. My pronouns are he and him. I'm wearing a white hooded sweatshirt, a white hoodie with the letters Def Vibe in gold, gold lettering on my chest. I, I am multicultural. I'm multiracial. I'm deaf, obviously. Gay. <laughs> oh right. Um, I have curly, curly dark hair, dark brown hair. Curly hair. Don't care. You know. <laughs> Dicky, I always love when you wear that deaf vibe hoodie. It's the best. And I also have some light scruff. Thank you so much, Alejandra. I do have some light scruff on the on my face. We have to include the scrap. Absolutely very important to include the scrap. So I think what we want to say is that we are the cast of Dark Disabled Stories, which is a new play at the public theater that Ryan wrote. And yes, hi, I wrote the play. Yes, and you play yourself. I do. And Dickie also plays you. He does. Unless he's playing Dickie. And and you play? I play myself, but I'm also describing everyone. So that's fun. And I think today I'm also going to be reading our questions out loud before we answer them. That's right. So shall we get to it? Let's do it. All right. Let's go for it. All right, first question. Ryan, you initially developed Dark Disabled Stories as a solo storytelling show. What inspired you to add other performers, us, and other perspectives? This is a great question. Uh, and I won't even pretend that I didn't know the questions in advance. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I am primarily an autobiographical solo performer, actor, and and so yes, this this play was developed like several of my others as a piece of solo storytelling. Uh, but I have to give credit to people outside of the theater world, as it were, in the dance world: Alice Shepard and Laura Lawson at Kinetic Light, Jerron Herman and Molly Joyce, who don't have their own company, but they did a wonderful thing together. And uh, and there were all kinds of multi-level access at these two dance shows. And then also in the sort of fine art world, um, our good friend Ezra Benes uh, put up all of these, you know, wonderful exhibits that had all these different ways of engaging depending on what your access needs were. And that was so exciting to me. And I just thought, what, what could what could a, a, a play that is still very much an autobiographical monologue look like if it included uh, other channels of both access and also performance so that it is no longer a solo play, but is in fact a play that's still a monologue that has other people in it. Um, and I'm really, really grateful to these two performers with me, Dickie and Alejandra, for coming in and and helping to tell these stories that are for the most part about me until they're not about me anymore. And I'm really, it's such a better play than it was 
three years ago when it was just me by myself. The the their performances are so wonderful and the layers that are added to the text of the play itself with the help of our wonderful director Jordan Fine and our Dazzle Andrew Morrill uh, are just fantastic and I can't wait for you all to to watch us tell a story together. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, you started the show um, <clears throat> with your own creative process. And then um, at the start of the pandemic or midway through, you added me and it became a series of Zoom workshops. Yes. And then and then we added Dickie, mm -hmm. which was such an awesome surprise because I knew that we would eventually, if we performed this in person, have a deaf performer with us and i was just always so curious about who it would be and i knew dicky before from an acting workshop a few years ago and i was so surprised to know that it was dicky and and how much it quickly became also a very deaf show and a disabled show and uh, so many things show um, <laughs> <laughs> Shall we, uh, shall we move on to the next question? Well, I want to, sure, sure. I just wanted to mention for the fans. Um, the fans. I, yeah, I think it's, I think it's just so fun. Uh, I did not know Dickie. I did not know Dickie. Oh, too and, bad for you. And I was chatting with one of our, uh, our unnamed gay disabled friends. I will not name. <laughs> we were sitting outside on a summer day, sitting and chatting. And this person mentioned a very uh, talented and charming and very attractive gentleman named Dickie Hartz. And I said, who is Dickie Hartz? Mm -hmm. And across the table came the Instagram. And then within two days of that encounter, uh, Dickie was named in the, the new cohort of Disability Future Fellows. And it all felt very oh, that's uh, right. serendipitous. And I said, I think this is a sign that, that Dickie is is the one, and I'm grateful that that Dickie answered our emails, which were very long and explanatory, and said yes to joining us. Uh, disability art and disability theater and disability culture world is very small, just like all sort of art culture theater world in New York City. So, I love that part of the story. Okay, now next question. All right, let's do it. Okay, here we go. Ryan's script is hilarious and brutally honest, especially when it comes to dating. Dickie and Alejandra, what were your reactions to reading it? And do you also have funny slash frightening dating tales? Well, it says Dickie and Alejandra, so I think we should go in that order. Okay. Well, first thing I do want to say, of course, I'm so honored to be in this, this play. I'm so excited that Ryan reached out to me. I'm so touched. I loved it. It was such a lovely surprise as well to work with you all. Um, yeah, so I remember when I was contacted and I read the script and at that time I was, you know, in traveling for the summer and I was reading the script and I just remember that like it was so, something stayed with me. Like something really touched me and I was like, I can really relate to this. So there was no question that the answer wasn't going to be yes. You know, as a deaf, disabled, gay man, like all of these experiences and nuances, these feelings and emotions were very universal to me. So I was just like, you know, it's, it's funny. Like, you know, there are some parts that are funny and there are some parts that are really touching. Like, you know, I'm sure you all will see it when you see the show, but yeah, it's super exciting. I was very excited. I'm sorry, like, if you can see me, my chair keeps moving, so I'm kind of sliding off screen, but <laughs> I have to keep moving myself back. But other than that, yeah, I think that was my initial response. Hmm. Well, um, as I mentioned before, our worlds are sort of small and intersecting when it comes to disability and theater and the arts. And I know that Ryan approached me in part because a lot of my work in the last few years has not been as an actor, but as an audio describer. So describing uh, performances and productions and video and things 
that you would watch for blind and visually impaired low vision audiences. So when Ryan said, well, actually you're an audio describer and you're also acting as yourself, I said, oh my goodness. And I also said, I hope I never have to share a dating story <laughs> in this show because I have zero interest in doing that. But there are so many stories that we have all heard that we all know for someone like myself who is visibly disabled, not in this box, but usually I'm sitting in a pretty big uh, motorized wheelchair. It's pretty visible. You can't avoid it. You can't get around it. So there's the eternal dilemma. If you're somebody on a dating app, do you post a picture where your mobility device, your wheelchair, your walker, your anything is visible? Uh, because there are so many people that are immediately like, you know, I don't even know which direction is the bad direction to be swiped in. Which is the good direction? Which is the bad direction? Uh, the good direction is swipe right and the bad direction is swipe left. Okay. So there are so many people when they're on these apps and, and they're just, you know, swipe left because people don't want to immediately burden themselves with dating a wheelchair user, somebody who uses a walker, somebody who has any disability that you can see at all, you know, and, and there are so many people who just immediately get pity vibes or immediately attract people that want to take care of them. And I'm just like, not looking for any of that. going to stay far, far away. I'm going to help Ryan and Dickie tell their stories though. I do want to add something really quick in regards to dating and a dating experience. So obviously, you know, each disability comes with its own nuances and their own dating experiences. I think that much is clear, but I can only speak from myself as a deaf person you know, being deaf is not always a visible disability, unless someone catches my hearing aids. They'll look like, oh, you have hearing aids? Are you deaf? You know, so like, especially today, like in this, but nowadays everyone walks around with AirPods. So everyone kind of also thinks that like, oh, your hearing aids. Oh, are those, are those headphones? Are those AirPods or something? But like mine aren't white, so they're fine. But whatever, I'm getting off point. My point is, you can't, you can't identify disability right away. So like you were saying, Alejandro, on these dating apps, like, you know, many pictures, not always, I don't have my hearing aids in. So, so like when I'm texting someone, I never talk about, I'm, I never talk about my deafness. I usually wait until I'm about to meet them. And then I let them know, hey, by the way, I am deaf. Does that change anything for you? You know, dating... I mean, it's really interesting. Like it's, you know, for the most part, you know, for me, I'm experiencing the natural communication barriers, of course. You know, some people are willing to text back and forth. Some people aren't willing to text. Some people, you know. And that's why you're not gonna catch me on these apps. That doesn't mean people shouldn't be on them. I just don't have time for the scientific method required to see what it takes to uh, see if I'm going to be accepted as a visibly disabled person or not. Also, those apps leave you such little room to say who you are, and I am actually a talker. So I just need my own app where it's like, let's tell our life stories and then we'll hook up. I know you're not a gay man, Alejandra, but Scruff would give you a lot of room. There are some people on Scruff who just write novels and novels and go for pages and pages and pages. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> yes, Ryan. Well, there's my missed opportunity. <laughs> All right. We're getting our next question prompt. And it says, Dickie and Alejandra, what was your creative process for integrating your own personal stories into the show? I'm going to go ahead and start this one because I have it at the top of my brain and I don't want it to run away. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, Ryan invited me to be a part of this process early on in the pandemic. So this all began on Zoom. And while I was not raring to share my relationship stories, I did have other stories that I was very keen on sharing with regard to being a physically disabled person 
accessing the world, particularly in New York City when it comes to getting around or not getting around or failing to get around or just live life. And, and you're just, from New York, right? You're, yes, you're I am a native New Yorker. I think I'm the only native New Yorker in these boxes right now. Is that true? Well, I was born in New York. So, oh, I, I didn't know that. Wait, 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 before we say anything, I didn't grow up here. I was born in Queens, so like, you know, I grew up in Virginia. I know, shocking. <laughs> I was born in yeah, Queens. This is, uh, yeah, this is this year's five years I've been, I've been living in New York. Excellent. Well, I was also born in Queens. Um, I have family in Virginia, but I have not made the mistake of living there yet. But let's get back on track. Um, Ryan had a script, obviously, well-formed when we started working. But he really wanted to make sure that I could incorporate my own experiences as someone who's lived in New York for a very long time and had to deal with, honestly, all the bullshit that it takes to be a disabled person just living daily life in a pretty aggressive city. I mean, we all love New York for all the reasons that we love New York, but New York doesn't always love you back, especially if you're a disabled person just trying to live your life, get from point A to point B, uh, live somewhere that you can actually access, get a job of any kind, or do anything at all. So Brian and I had a lot of brainstorming around what those things were like for both of us, how they were different, how they were similar. And so we eventually were able to um, work on the ways that I would both describe what's happening as a describer and share some of my stories as myself living in New York. So, I mean, the creative process for mm -hmm. me being involved in this production with Ryan so far, it's a good question. I think after I read that script, you know, I reached out and then we had I, we had a workshop last fall. And I remember like also we had I remember we had different Zoom conversations and like that's how I was able to really share my story and kind of what I could identify and relate with as a disabled gay man. But what I can also sh highlight that's different as a deaf disabled gay man. So, I mean, it was just, it really stemmed from a lot of conversations. It, you know, a lot of playing around, experimenting, seeing what works, seeing what didn't work. And I'm just really grateful for Ryan and his ability to really, I want to say, capture the essence of my stories. Yeah, Dickie, your story is newer to the script, but it's so exciting to I see. I think it's been a great thing. collaboration so far. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think it's been a great collaboration. Such a great collaborative process. And I just want to yeah, say, it is a new edition. Yes, <laughs> it is a new. Dickie's is hot off the press. Mm -hmm. uh, hot off the press. But it. But we have been sort of devising. Dickies together since since November when we had our workshop and we went back. We did have several Zooms in between and then when we started rehearsals we had another conversation and another conversation and that's I want to highlight that that's very similar to sort of what happened with Alejandra too which is that I just I wanted to um, learn as much as I could about what was interesting for you both to talk about and then find the way to make it sound like you were talking about it for the first time. Um, and so it's exciting to me. I have not often written monologues for other people and other people's voices. And I, so it really, I mean, uh, Dickie, a couple weeks ago, we had like an hour conversation and Dickie has a wonderful um, there's a wonderful team of interpreters interpreting for all of us together in the room. And so with their help, I sort of recorded everything and then I transcribed everything. And I just listened to that for like three or four hours. <laughs> and, and then it starts to become distilled and then it starts to be shaped. But I really need to understand how does this person talk differently than I do? And what are the words that they like to use that I don't like to use? And, what are words that 
I use too much that don't sound like them. And I think and that's still that's still in process. Actually, we're still we're yeah. still refining. I heard there was a session in which one of the wonderful folks on our creative team sort of embodied me and how I would say things. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> which I love. So I, um, but, you know, we don't have a finished script yet. Not quite. It's, but it's, it's, but it's great fun. And I, I'm, I'm so, uh, you both get these wonderful moments to, to, to break away from the Ryan of it all. And, uh, and they are newly shaped. Some of them are newly shaped, but even Alejandra's that came into rehearsal, it was totally different than it had been in previous iterations. And so, uh, I love I've loved working with you both and sort of tailoring tailoring to your own expression. It's very alive. It's it's very much a, a living thing. And I think it's not going to be hard for us to make it new every time. So I hope we we'll all come. There are more questions, but oh yes, let's do please, let's do the next one. Let's serve it up. There it is. All right. Dark Disabled Stories is a powerful piece, funny, raunchy, and moving. What do you hope audiences take away from the show? Hmm. This is hard. I mean, people, dramaturgs keep asking me this. Oh, but we're not <laughs> talking to dramaturgs or for I know. I know. What, what do we want people to take away from the show? We want people to take sex away from the show. I mean, okay. this is a very sexy show. I may not want to talk about my sexual experiences, but we're certainly talking about y'all's. We, so we, I think are, I want, we do. I think I want people to to know if they don't already that disability is as inherently sexual as any version of life experience on the same spectrum. I mean, we're going to be talking a lot about disability and sex um you know mm -hmm. so that's that's a big takeaway i would think um otherwise they wouldn't have written raunchy in the question i also want people to take away the nuances of what it means to translate stuff into sign language and how how sex gets delivered that way because that's something i'm always learning about as we go and that's something that's going to be new, I think, for a lot of audiences. Yeah. Yeah, I think... I think the people of the audience will have a takeaway. I think they'll take away that... I don't really want to sound super cliche, but... We really are just like everybody else. Like, you know, we do have needs. We have sexual needs as human beings. Oh, there goes the chair again. And yeah, also, you know, each disability, each disability has their own experiences. It's not a universal experience. I feel like that's something that's very, a very common mis misconception is that people think that one size fits all for disability for people with disabilities and not understanding that everyone is different everyone's experiences are different they have different backgrounds they have different needs so i think you know i, I mean well i hope that's what the audience will take away from our show i agree and i think and, and, and also be a little bit more open-minded too sorry yes. i didn't mean to interrupt you Tiki. Uh, the last thing i want to say i think before we do the next question is that wait i should answer the question too because i wrote Right. Yeah, 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 no, no. But what the thing I wanted to make sure I said is <clears throat> that you know, we're very excited about our disabled community coming to see our show because as much as we want other people to learn from an experience that isn't theirs, we want so much all the moments that our disability community are going to hopefully relate to and just be right there with us. I think that's the part I'm most excited about. Okay, now, now Ryan, the playwright, answer the questions. Well, I heard Dickie say we all have needs, sexual needs, and we all have access needs too. Oh, yes. And we live in a city um, 
particularly for those of us with mobility needs, but even far beyond that, that it isn't kind, as Alejandro was saying earlier, it's, it's kind of a relentless, New York is a relentless place. And so what I hope people take away, you know, the zoom out beyond the dating, which there is the sort of quadrant of stories that are, are all dating themed and are very gay themed and very sexy and raunchy as they say. But it is also just about how do strangers interact with each other? And how do strang what what do strangers think they know about the other person? And that doesn't just mean, you know, what do non-disabled people think when they look at me, but also what do I think when I when I look at someone else? And what are the assumptions that I'm making? about that person and their lived experience, which may be completely devoid of truth because I'm just doing a sort of snap judgment of a person. And um, I think empathy is really important in this show. That sounds, I mean, that doesn't sound cliche. That sounds like, mm, like somber and sad. We promise that the show is funny. Of course it is funny, but I think we're both, uh, the non-disabled and the disabled audiences, I hope that, you know, empathy is something that they really consider as they're watching and listening and recognizing how do they interact with the people that they meet on the street or on the subway or at a restaurant or at a gay bar or whatever, wherever, um, because we don't ever know what somebody else is living with or living through and what kind of day they had that morning or afternoon or evening. And, and uh, these are, these are stories in which, you know, I sort of step out of my apartment, not anticipating that my disability is going to cause a stir. <laughs> and yet it does, or, and yet I watch somebody else's disability cause a stir that they didn't intend to happen either. And what is that about? And I think the thing that is, a common thread is either empathy or a lack of empathy. Um, and in which these sort of, these are all individual stories. It's not one overarching plot, um, but the commonality is sort of like, well, something happens. There's a conflict either internal or external and disability is either directly involved or peripherally involved, but it's always there. And how can we be, how can we be kinder to each other and kinder to ourselves? Um, and I'm so excited for uh, being able to sort of feel the audience energy every night. I think it's gonna be different every night, but I think especially when disabled people are in the audience, deaf and disabled people, we really hope are, are uh, come out to See the show. There's an access code. Uh, there's an access code, access DDS for thirty dollar tickets, and you. I just think that, especially as we've gotten toward the end of the play this week in rehearsals, I can just sort of feel the emotional buildup of what it's going to really be like when there are disabled people in that audience, uh, relating to us, and sharing in those experiences with us. And um, it's 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 going to be an intense experience, but I think it's going to be a powerful one and one that's really worth uh, worth sharing worth sharing with all of you. While theater still has a very long way to go, the industry has been making strides in terms of disability representation on stage. Are there any watershed moments that stand out to you? Well, if I'm we're... um, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Dickie. I want to say for theater, not, I wouldn't say I'm not too sure, but I would say definitely for in TV and the film entertainment, I think there's huge impactful things that are going on for me as a deaf actor. You know, um, you know, especially last year, the Academy Award, award uh, Troy Kotzer won for Best Supporting Actor. 
you know, finally, it's the second time a deaf person in history won the Academy Award. I want to say, how long has the Academy been around? Over 30 years since the last time someone has won, a deaf person has won an award. So for me, that was like, felt like a good step. Felt like there was hope. I felt that there were more roles coming up for deaf actors. You know, people like myself, you know, who's not only deaf, but deaf and gay. And, and deaf and BIPOC. And, you know, for, for me, that was so hugely inspirational to see that. And then I would say another thing, I guess, would be for Lauren, an actress, Lauren Ridloff, was just in Marvel's The Eternals. I mean, the, the first deaf, well, first, first deaf superhero, and then to add the first deaf female BIPOC, <laughs> you know, superhero, like, that's wonderful. And seeing that really gives me hope. But for now, for the question to theater, I'm trying to really think, like, I am noticing, you know, there are more and more, more and more roles for people with disabilities. I don't know, I'm sorry, let me not say roles, let's say casting for disabled actors. I think that's great. I think one thing that, you know, deaf actors were still kind of not, we're still kind of lost in that mix a little bit. We're not often cast. And I think the reason behind that is the language barriers where other disabil disabled actors can hear they can speak, they can speak English still. So I think as a deaf actor, we just, you know, we sign, so it's it's different. So that's just kind of where I'm thinking, my thoughts are about theater. Hmm. I mean, you know, I'm don't get me wrong, I'm, that's why I'm so excited and grateful for the show. Like, I can't wait. <laughs> Alondra, you had something? Um. I did, I mean, there's so much that's been happening. We're particularly lucky in, places like New York and for folks who are in LA and the big cities where uh, art and theater and film and media tend to concentrate that we have more opportunities, I would say in the last five years for sure. Um, I'm only a working actor again more recently, but if we're talking about watershed moments, to me that feels like things that wider audiences would be aware of. So like, Deaf West Spring Awakening that, you know, opened in 2015. A lot of people were aware of that production. And the fact that Ali Stroker was the first wheelchair user to ever win a Tony, and that was, you know, 2019. But she still didn't have access to the stage, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Um, so those are big sort of, if we're if we're talking about watershed moments, those are the big ones that I can think of as far as theater itself. What about you, Ryan? Yeah. Um, people ask me variations on this question a lot. And I always think about how, you know, when I, when I think about representation, because everybody talks about how important representation is, and that is important. And I hope that that is one of the things we're providing in, with this show is representation. But, um, there's this there's this element when you're watching and consuming theater art film where you go oh but i i i i see myself in that character and that character is not deaf or that character is not disabled but, but that's who i relate to the most and you sort of have to find your way in to stories that are not created with you in mind um, as a viewer and if you're lucky, also as a as a potential performer. Um, but so I'm thinking about, you know, for me, definitely Allie's Tony Wynn and thinking about Allie, you know, giving that speech, having come on from the wings, yes, but giving that speech. And like my mom, who's known that my dream was to win a Tony since I was a child, watching it in Ohio and like, sobbing and hopefully sobbing for the you know the right reasons and not for disability inspiration reasons but i know that she's reacting to the fact that like my son had a dream that he didn't know was possible and now somebody has proven that in fact it is um and an award is like okay an award but yes and i also want one like you know so like it, i it, it, when you have that benchmark to look to and then somebody 
as brilliant as Ali comes along in a, in a show that is, you know, meant something completely different when it was made in 1934, 1933, to what we saw in that production is really, really special. Um, and I also want to point to uh, Madison Ferris in The Glass Menagerie as Laura, as the first mobility disabled actress to play Laura on Broadway. Uh, I love The Glass Menagerie and I've loved it since I was a teenager. That was another situation where I watched that play, which did have a disabled character in it, but I said, oh, I'm, I'm Tom. I'm the gay, angry, angsty artist. I'm not, I'm not Laura, I'm Tom. And then I saw the, the, the second to last revival, which had Cherry Jones and uh, Celia Keenan-Bolger as Laura. And Celia Keenan-Bolger is not a disabled actress, but because that was the first time I had ever seen it live, I was so viscerally shaken by the scenes with Laura and realizing, oh, this is why everybody told me that it was me. Because suddenly off the page, I was like, oh, I do. I do relate to her. And in fact, I can relate to them both. I can relate to two different characters in the play and that still be valid. So then to see Madison completely reinterpret the role of Laura, um, less to do with her mobility and more to do with her sort of stoic and icy and no nonsense dialogue readings and interpretation. Her scene with the gentleman caller went from this, I think, you know, really like emotional, visceral thing for me in seeing Sue and Boulder do it to suddenly seeing Madison do it. It was charged. It was sexy. It was hot. It was like, <gasps> Ooh, there's, there's, there's sex in the glass menagerie. There, and there's not, there was not literal sex. Don't, don't mistake me. But um, that was a production that Sam Gold directed. And it was suddenly this, it was this very heated and passionate and charged scene. Same exact words, but a completely different actress, completely different performance. And yes, authentically disabled. And, and um, I obviously, as a writer, I'm a creator of new work and very passionate about new work, but I grew up on the classics, musicals and otherwise. And so to see a play that means as much to me as The Glass Menagerie done in that way, um, particularly that scene uh, between Laura and the gentleman caller was a really uh, powerful moment that I won't soon forget. Dickie? Sure, and also I just want to add if you can add about something I've been thinking about in history and I remember in the 1980s there was a deaf woman you know, Phyllis Fletch, she was a deaf actress who actually won the Tony Award on Broadway, I want to say in 1980s, um, around, that was inspired the film, which led to Marley Matlin's mm. and her career developments and her later wins. And also recently, I want to say in 2018, 19, Lauren Rudloff was also nominated for the same role that Phyllis was in the 1980s. So I, I mean, I think that's wonderful. I think that's amazing. At the same time, you know, we do have hope to see more other productions. So far, that's like the only one play that's been really anything tied with deafness. And uh, that's Children of Lesser God, for those who don't know. And, you know, I mean, great, mind you, it's a wonderful play. It's very heartwarming. It's very, it's very touching. It's, you know, That's why I want to thank Alejandra for, um, I also like new work too. So that's why I want to thank Alejandra for mentioning Spring Awakening. You know, where they have the more deaf centered stories written by deaf people or co-written even. I want to see more of that. I feel like so far that we've just had the, you know, children of a lesser God. That's it. We have that one that we've been working on and I just want to see more of them. Yeah, that was, I think, my last point. These these watershed moments we've been talking about, with the exception of, of Dickie's uh, example from 
the 80s uh, there have been few and far between in this in this sort of room we know of more work that's coming and more deaf work that's coming and you know there's stuff that's being workshopped right now but our cultural work doesn't always make it past the barrier of mainstream we all know of amazing disabled artists and performers doing amazing work but it tends to stay in our cultural cir circle no matter how amazing it is that's right so the watershed moments that we've been talking about uh, deaf west spring awakening was 2015 and uh, Glass Menagerie, the production uh, that we've been mentioning with Madison Ferris, that was 2017. And Oklahoma, that was 2019. So that wasn't none of that very long ago. And, and yeah, we need more. And that's why we're trying to be part of the more right now. Mm. TDF's mission is to make theater accessible to all. Have you ever taken advantage of any of our programs? And I think now we can start with Dickie. Yes. <laughs> okay. So definitely I've taken advantage of any show that I can go to that has any type of open captions available. You know, I really appreciate open captions. You know, that's great for the accessibility tool. You know, of course, of having American Sign Language interpreters are phenomenal as well. One thing... You know, I, you know, I, with open captions, like it's kind of like a one-time only type of thing, like, or it might conflict with something else. Like, I wish open caption was something that was happening all the time, not just like once or twice or three times. Like, we have to find that show that day. Like, you know, we have to make sure that we're available that day, that time for that show to watch open captions. You know, but other than that, like, if I see something, you know, that has captions open captions and i'm available my schedule is free of course i'm there um so i i'm aware i have been a tdf member in the past and i'm aware of all the sort of different programming that tdf has i've sometimes helped out with making some media accessible for tdf in past years but because my main access needs is physical there's not that much that TDF can do to sort of make the theaters create more accessible seating. You know, it sort of is what it is. Um, so I've been a fan of TDF's programming from afar, but also recognizing the limitations of what organizations like TDF can do. There's my phone again. I have also been a TDF member in the past, and I have mobility, limited mobility, but I walk with a walker and I don't use a wheelchair, which means that I don't necessarily require, I don't require a wheelchair space. I mean, I wouldn't want to take a wheelchair space away from somebody who needs one, but I do, um, you know, obviously prefer, strongly prefer not having to navigate stairs. So I want to see theater and I want to see theater that's affordable, which is an amazing thing that TDF provides. And so I don't really want to be limited to the only the times when they're offering orchestra seating or mobility seating. I need to renew my membership uh, in, hopes that, in hopes that someday the rules uh, will expand to be more inclusive for all of us. I think this vibe will take us into our next question very nicely. <laughs> And that question is, what's one thing all theaters and arts organizations should do right now to start becoming more accessible and inclusive? I mean, I want to toot our horn because our show is very much in the spirit of inclusivity and accessibility in the sense that we're trying to make it as accessible as possible in the ways that are possible to us. So we're trying to make sure that it is accessible to folks who are deaf and hard of hearing and blind and low vision by creating ASL and creating audio description that is relevant and interesting. And we're going to have visual elements that tie into captioning. So we're, we're doing 
what we can and that doesn't mean we can make every aspect of any show accessible to every single person's needs but i think for me accessibility always starts with intention so no matter what you're creating in the world just the intention of how is this accessible to how many kinds of people and how is it not um i think another thing that is important to the vibe of our show that I would like to see happen more is the concept of relaxed performances. I know for TDF, a lot of that lies in sort of um, autism friendly performances and similar, but just the idea that performances are relaxed so that anyone can enjoy them no matter where they're coming from in terms of their experience with theater or their ability to sort of stay still or stay seated in a certain way, just being respectful of the idea that people coming to theater have different needs. That's something that we see a lot more, I wanna say um, outside of the country. In England, uh, colleagues there pay a little more attention to relaxed performances, but sometimes it, it comes down to funding as well, realistically. So what what should arts organizations and theaters do? Well, they should do lots of stuff if they have the money to do it. But before that, they should sort of make a commitment to sort of look at what they are doing and be honest about whether or not what they're producing is accessible and be honest about that to their audiences and say, well, we have access in the following ways or we don't yet have this but we're working on it it sort of becomes a conversation that's never had or a conversation that's had in the spirit of well we better create accessibility or talk about accessibility because if we don't we'll get in trouble but if the intention is listen we want to be honest and forthcoming about the access that is part of our work without being confrontational or defensive, that in itself could go such a long way to make people feel even welcome at all, even if they're not fully accommodated right off the bat in the ways that work best for them. The intention of it could be so different. Dickie, do you want to go or do you want me to go? I mean, I think Alejandra really kind of said it all. I mean, I mean, if I could just, for me, I would just add ASL. You know, American Sign Language. <laughs> uh, it's so it's so fascinating because of because we're so in, in, embedded in this process of what we are making now together. And I have made other plays that are not as radically accessible as this, as this by far. And I will make more, you know, those plays will come back and the way, how I can or cannot reshape them based on the content of those plays, who knows? Um, but I'm sitting here thinking about what we're doing now and thinking about how beautiful it is. Um, that so many people can be included, that so many people can come whenever they want, that they don't have to wait for a specific day of the week or a specific uh, single day during a run, as Dickie was describing, for something like open captions, when honestly open captions are so, like, anyone who uses any form of technology, anytime I see, now anytime I see a screen on stage, I go, why aren't there captions? There could be captions because there's a screen. Like I don't, it, uh, it, that, it, it seems, it's just not a thing that is thought of or considered unless it is a disability specific play. And even then, when it is a disability specific play, it depends on the kind of disability that it is being talked about because not every effort is made to be inclusive to as many people as possible. So I want to say in a, just things I'm thinking about right now, 
this notion, which happens all the time on Broadway and off Broadway of, you know, no late seating and or uh, if you exit at any time during the performance, you will not be allowed to re-enter. That is incredibly ableist, just absolutely beyond, beyond. It's somebody with a very small bladder, but for many other reasons that like in the, instills fear. I, I can't get up. I can't disturb. <gasps> oh, no, 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 no. But like, I can promise you as a performer, if you have the choice between, you know, wetting yourself in my show or getting up and coming back and feeling a lot better, I want you to get up and come back. So getting rid of that sort of notion of don't disturb the actors, that 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 is number one. And then number two, um, and I also wanted to lift our brilliant access dramaturg, Alison Copet, who we just adore and is, is making the show uh, so much deeper and richer and more accessible. This notion of noise and, and, and loud noises and sudden loud noises. Um, uh, y- you know, I, we are navigating what that means for our particular play right now. There are not a ton of very loud noises, but there are some sudden things that for some people might be, you know, a bit of a, a startle situation. And so we're trying to minimize that as much as possible. And I have seen shows recently in which I think, gosh, why did that person have to slam the door? Or why did that person have to bang the door in uh, to announce their presence in a way that is meant to be shocking when for some of us, that shock isn't just, oh, ha ha, wasn't that a fun theater trick? But actually it is upsetting. Like, I, I don't like it. And when this happened to me recently, I literally was in the front row and said, and I just outwardly kept saying, oh my God, like, oh my God, you know, and do the actors want me to be saying that? No, but I didn't want to be, you know, sort of uh, intentionally shaken by the sound of a door or thing or, or the sound of somebody barging in because of how scary that is. So I think, um, and it, even just, the use of sudden, extremely loud noise, you know, uh, isn't just related to relaxed performance, isn't just related to uh, people on the autism spectrum. I, I, as someone with cerebral palsy and many other people, those things are just not uh, friendly to us. And so wondering, asking yourselves as creatives, is this really loud sound really all that necessary and is there a better way that we can maybe make it uh we can still tell the story without instilling fear and trauma in people um those are just two things don't tell us we can't re-enter and don't try to uh scare us just for the fun of it I, I'm pro both those things. I want to say uh, one last thing, which is a related thing and, and speaks to what Dickie was referencing. Of You can only see certain performances with certain accessibility features at certain times. Ryan was also mentioning this. And that will apply to captioned performances and sign language interpreted performances and audio described performances, which is uh, my wheelhouse more when I'm not... Um, wearing my actor hat audio described performances of of all kinds are few and far between um this year i learned that one of our major ballet companies in new york city in its storied 60-year history has never had an audio described performance period unless they've been traveling and hosted by the Kennedy Center in did you Washington. Say 60 years? You said 60 years? 60 I years. did, six zero. Mm-hmm. Um, so audio description is something that I do and is inherently intended for blind and low vision audiences, but like captioning could benefit so many other kinds of audience members because being able to explain what's happening in a show can benefit so many people and just thinking about making that more available like 
sign language interpreted performances like caption performances i get it that's that's a future thing it's a funding thing it's a not happening today thing but to my earlier point of opening the conversation of opening the possibilities of realizing that you shouldn't do this just because if you don't you can get into leg litigation or legislative issues no it's because you want people to enjoy your work and if you can't do it now at least start talking about when you can or why you aren't and why it matters oh are we at last question time i think so oh there it is last question be each other's casting directors oh what role would you put the other in i've got an easy one for ryan because ryan you've always wanted to be the prince in cinderella oh my gosh from when i was a little boy. <laughs> oh my gosh yes 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 you're done beautifully by my friend Pella Montalban in the 1970s. That's right, you're friends. I love we're that. We're friends now. I've made friends with the prince. Uh, so that's very sweet of you, Alejandra. Do you have one for Dickie? I'm thinking, I'm brainstorming. I did get the questions in advance, but this is not one that I, that I thought of. If I can go. Yeah, go ahead. I would definitely... <sighs> I definitely wasn't planning for this question, prep for this question. So I'm really thinking about this. I would say, wait, are we talking about TV or, th or theater? Anything. So I think I would cast Ryan in a play. The Boys in the Band. The Boys in the Band. Okay. Boys in the the boys in the bed. Yeah. Or in the heights. When well, no, in the no, not not in the height. Probably I wouldn't in fit in in the heights. <laughs> Sorry, that was the interpreter's mistake. Inheritance. Oh. Inheritance. Oh. Ooh. Spelling is hard. Fingers spelling is hard. I would now, I, now that was for theater, but for TV, I would absolutely cast Ryan in probably White Lotus, <gasps> season three. Oh and for Alejandra, I could see you on two TV shows, definitely. Superstore. <laughs> I love that. I missed that show. And uh. Abbott Kinney, I think it's called. I don't know that one. Oh, I, I just watched this. I don't know. It's the, the, the Last of Us. I can see that. Oh, interesting. Well, now we have to cast Dickie in something. Well, no, 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 no. Yes. Okay. So um, for me, I would like to see Dickie. I don't know if Dickie does musicals. I'd like to see Dickie do Alban and La Cache à Oh, the I, I am what I am. The the role that I, that Nathan Lane did in the Birdcage. Um, I can see that. It, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And, and let's oh, see. Okay. I, let's think about TV. I would like to see Dickie on. I would like to see Dickie on Bridgerton. Oh wow! Yes. Mmm. I, but I also want you to be a love interest on Hacks. You know Hacks? Yeah. Love Hacks. I want you to be the one of the, the assistant's love interest. I just want to see Dickie in like period clothing, just stripping and just having. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, the newest Bridgerton, I need it. Alejandra, I want you on stage to be do any role once done by Mary Testa. Huh? <laughs> um, and on TV, I would love to see you on as a ooh oh oh fabulous um, as one of the the uh, 
the residents of the Arconia on Only Murders. Yes, Open. let's make that happen. So <laughs> somehow we're going to manifest all of this to the world. We're putting it out there to our theater community, to our TV community. Yes, manifest it. Manifest yeah. it out. I think I think that's it. That is Thank it. you. Thank, Thank you, you TDF so family. Much. Thank you, TDF. And please come and see Dark Disabled Stories at the Public Theater in partnership with and produced by the Bushwick Star. Our uh, previews start February 28th. Previews begin February 28th. And we won't say a closing date just in case it goes for longer than it's currently announced. Because it might if you all come. That's right. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you for bye. listening.